How can we optimize the recovery of oil and gas reserves? This is the underlying question driving the work of the Edinburgh Reservoir Description Group, based at Heriot Watt University. A multidisciplinary group of geologists, engineers, physicists and mathematicians work on new ways of understanding the processes that operate in subsurface oil and gas reservoirs. Reservoirs are by nature heterogeneous because of the many processes involved in their formation. Reservoir sandstones are formed by the deposition of sediments, like these ripples on the beach. Within the sandstone is the vital network of interconnecting pore spaces. Burial and compaction of such sediments results in the formation of subsurface reservoir units. This cliff, exposed on the shore of Fife in Scotland, gives us an ideal illustration of typical reservoir heterogeneity. It contains a variety of sediment and tectonic features. After deposition, the sediments were buried and compacted. The sediment units were then folded and faulted during several phases of tectonic deformation. A major fault can be seen running along the foreshore. Our work has focused on the effects of the sediment structure on reservoir processes. The faults and fractures will, of course, also have an effect, but the sediments must be understood first. Using field mapping procedures supported by airborne photographic techniques, we have mapped and logged the sediment structures in the cliff. These methods are used at many different outcrops to construct quantitative models of sediment architecture in different settings. This particular cliff is about 10 meters high and 100 meters long, which is about the size of a grid block in many field-scale reservoir models. It is therefore important to assess the effective flow properties of a block this size. What are the aspects of its internal structure that really matter? These sediments were deposited in a deltaic environment, which might have looked something like this. Fine-grained sands were deposited in a shallow marine pro-delta setting. These were then overlain by coals and channel sands laid down in the delta plain. Episodic movement of faults affected sedimentation, changing water depths and giving rise to soil horizons on uplifted blocks. The strata exposed at the cliff can be subdivided into sediment facies, interpreted from the depositional structures and trace fossils. The base of the cliff is marked by heterolithic facies. These are finely interbedded sand and shale lamina deposited in the distal parts of the pro-delta. In reservoir engineering terms, this layer acts as a lower boundary to the reservoir. Overlying this is a thick unit of fine-grained sand deposited in the pro-delta itself. These sands have a layered appearance at the large scale, but on closer inspection are actually composed of ripple lamination. Towards the top of the ripple sand unit, a layer of cross-bedded sands marks the encroachment of a channel which was then abandoned and overlain by more ripple facies material. A soil zone and the layer of coal mark a change to a delta plane setting, probably associated with local uplift. Overlying all of this is a thick channel sand unit containing trough cross beds. These are spoon shaped beds formed beneath chaotic currents. They coalesce in a semi-regular pattern of stacked trough crossbed sets. These facies can be related to the depositional model. The sedimentary succession is summarized on a conventional sediment log. Similar logs can be derived from subsurface core data. One of the main issues in reservoir characterization is deciding what lies in between wells. In this example, there is good correlation between hypothetical wells at either end. However, it is still important to correctly calculate the flow properties of each correlated formation. Wireline logs are also important sources of information in the subsurface. Here we can use the detailed outcrop data to predict the likely wireline log response. Gamma, resistivity and density logs for this outcrop section have been modeled using outcrop data and assuming a hydrocarbon bearing interval. Note the poor vertical resolution of the log data within the sands. The low density, thin, 25 centimeter or less coals would, however, be detected. 
The higher permeability of the upper sand is reflected in the higher resistivity. Using a probe permeameter, we can measure the variation of permeability in different portions of the sediment strata. This can be done in the field, as shown here, but also on core samples in the laboratory. The probe permeameter works by injecting nitrogen through an annular tip pressed onto the rock surface. Care needs to be taken with surface preparation. The pressure and flow rate are recorded. The permeability can then be calculated with reference to calibrated samples. Permeability measurements along a vertical profile at a 5 cm spacing, where access is possible, provide a description of the permeability variation. The upper sand in this section appears less variable than the lower sand. This variability can be quantified by the coefficient of variation. This is defined as the standard deviation divided by the arithmetic average. As well as indicating variability, the CV can be used as a guide to assessing the number of samples required in a particular formation or sediment facies. From rules of thumb we have developed, the upper sand has a CV of 0 0.45, suggesting only 20 samples are needed to estimate the average permeability to an acceptable tolerance. On the other hand, the lower sand has a CV of nearly 1, suggesting 100 samples are needed. At the smallest scale, permeability variation is assessed using grids of measurements. Very often, measurements taken horizontally differ from measurements taken vertically. This is because of the effects of small-scale lamination. In the ripple faces, small-scale probe data picks out the contrast between sandy and micaceous laminae. Horizontal permeability measurements are about twice the vertical measurements giving a KVKH ratio of 0 0.5 at this scale. Using this data, we can construct permeability models of the different sediment faces in the cliff. The two main sandstone units are composed dominantly of ripple lamination in the lower unit and trough crossbreading in the upper unit. The probe permeameter measurements can be averaged to show the large-scale permeability structure. The main units are easily identified, but the details of small-scale variability are obscured. We will see later why it is important not to neglect the smaller-scale variations which can be detected with the probe permeameter. We then use this data to construct flow models. For example, in the crossbed model, flow vectors have this distribution. Most of the flow occurs in the upper part of the crossbeds, which have higher permeability. Flow directions are also influenced by the bedding. These single phase flow effects could occur in reservoirs in which a miscible fluid is injected. In this illustration of a unit mobility flood of crossbeds, we see how the injected fluid prefers the upper parts of each crossbed unit. However, with two-phase flow, other effects of heterogeneity also occur. In this water flood of the crossbed model, we see how the oil and water distribution is strongly affected by the sediment structure. This is because of the capillary forces. The net effect is that oil becomes trapped in higher permeability zones as it is unable to pass through surrounding low permeability zones. The amount of trapping depends on the details of the structure, as well as the flow rates and fluid properties. We can scale up these effects using pseudo-relative permeability functions, which we call geosudos. On the left-hand side is a simulation of water flood in the lower sand unit, in which we have captured the small-scale effects using geosudos. On the right-hand side, the same water flood is simulated, but using average permeability data at the 30 cm scale. The waterfront in the 30 cm average model progresses as a simple function of the permeability in each 30 cm layer. In the geo-pseudo model, the small-scale structure plays the dominant role, with the water advancing most in the high permeability crossbed layer, but being hindered in the lower permeability rippled layers. The small-scale structure will affect the production of oil prior to and following the breakthrough of water. With the geo-pseudo model, the oil production rises steadily until water breakthrough, after which little further oil is produced. With rock curves, the oil production is greater as water breakthrough is delayed. 
Additional oil production occurs after breakthrough and the total oil recovered is greater than for the geo-pseudo model. Rock curves in this case are likely to give optimistic production forecasts. If we return to our modelled log of the section, we would expect the trapped oil in the rippled lower sand to be visible in the higher flushed zone shallow resistivities. So, with a two-phase flow process such as a water flood, the small-scale sediment structure can be as important as the larger-scale permeability structure. Thus, in reservoir engineering, it is important to understand how the flow process and the heterogeneity interact. In a water flood, capillary forces are likely to be important, and a detailed understanding of the small-scale sediment structure is needed. With gas injection, the overall shape of the reservoir is usually more important than the smaller scale heterogeneity. In both cases, a good appreciation of the geological structure and the flow physics is required. Good reservoir engineering therefore requires people with skills in geology, statistics, physics and engineering who can understand the whole problem. At Harriet Watt, we are training a new profession of geoengineers to tackle hydrocarbon reservoir development in an integrated way. Our research also continues, constantly improving our understanding of this complex interaction of fluid and rock. These new methods are already making an impact on the practical reservoir engineering of many oil fields in the North Sea and elsewhere. <laughs>